Okay, I'm continuing my talks that I started yesterday on social strategy. I'm moving on now to immediate tax and monetary policies that a, a socialist government could follow. One of the triumphs of the City of London and the rise of the financial interest that I was talking about in the last video was when Gordon Brown made the Bank of England independent of, though still owned by the government. This had been an objective of the monetarist economists because they wanted to remove monetary policy as one of the tools that governments could use to maintain full employment. After it was put under an independent committee by Gordon Brown and no longer under the direction of the Chancellor of the Exchequer, its responsibilities were restricted to maintaining the liquidity of the banking sector and controlling inflation. Well, it clearly didn't do very well at maintaining the liquidity of the, the, the banking sector because we had the Northern Rock actually have a run on the banks, which is the first time that that had happened since the 19th century. However, it, it, its policies for controlling inflation were, when compared with other central banks, not bad. It currently has a target of 2% and is supposed to use interest rates to adjust policy if the inflation rate is too high or too low relative to the 2% target. Now this is better than the European Central Bank which doesn't have a too low target and therefore it's not able to engage in expansionary monetary policy. So it's not as bad as it could have been. However, the policy set out completely ignored the trade balance. They treated monetary policy as being solely a matter of meeting the requirements of the financial sector. The One of the first things a new government should do is give the Bank of England two targets, both the inflation rate and the trade balance. The equivalent target to the 2% inflation target would be to achieve a neutral trade balance. That is to say, neither surplus of exports nor surplus of imports. You can only have additional targets if you specify additional means of achieving them. So if the interest rate is being used to control the inflation rate, it can't simultaneously be used to control the trade balance. On the other hand, intervention in the foreign exchange markets is still possible. After Black Wednesday it was held that it was hopeless for central banks to try and intervene in the foreign exchange markets because the attempt of the Bank of England to hold up the value of the pound in the face of Soros' run on the pound completely failed. But it doesn't follow from that that a bank cannot hold the value of a currency down. That was an attempt to hold the value of the currency up. It's quite possible for them to intervene in the gold and foreign exchange markets to bring the value of the pound down if there's a trade deficit and if there's a trade surplus they can in principle raise the value of the pound because the cir circumstances of a, a trade surplus are actually favourable to them being able to do that. In the longer term, the central bank would have a role in the transition to a non-monetary economy, regulating and supervising a non-monetary unit of account. But I'm not going to cover that until later on when I'm dealing with changes to property relations. I'm going to get on now to fiscal policy. Now. Up until the Callaghan government 
ran into a crisis in 1976. It had been accepted that a secondary objective of fiscal policy, given that the first objective is to fund government spending, the secondary objective of fiscal policy was to maintain an aggregate level of demand in the economy sufficient to ensure full employment. State and ex- expenditure and investment was expanded in downturns to ensure that those who were laid off in the private sector would be taken on to work on state investment contracts and in the public sector. And this was the key to the building up of the strengths of the trade union movement during the 1950s and 60s. It's clear to me that uh, socialists in the Labour Party should be advocating that this be restored as a key aim of government fiscal policy. In doing this, it's necessary to combat the idea, which is widespread, that nothing can be done about uh, unemployment because unemployment, it is said, is due to automation and the rise of the robot. Well, as I've said in previous talks, the rate of improvement in labour productivity in the recent recession since 2010 has been way below the rate of improvement in labour productivity which took place in the 50s and 60s. In those days we were getting 2.5% or so improvement in labour productivity. It's been under 1%, closer to half a percent in in Britain since 2010. If labour productivity has been stagnant since 2010, you clearly can't blame unemployment over that period on robots. We were able to have full employment under conditions of much more rapidly rising labour productivity in the past. The difference is state policy. There have been a policy of deliberate cuts in government expending to exacerbate the downturn rather than policies of expanding government expenditure to reduce the downturn. The objective has been to further polarise the division of income towards the wealthy rather than the reverse, which was the case under previous governments. But that's a secondary issue, secondary objective of fiscal policy, to maintain full employment. The primary objective of fiscal policy is to to fund government expenditure. And socialists have traditionally advocated direct run indirect taxation for that. You can go right back to the Communist Manifesto where it calls for the funding of government expenditure by a progressive income tax. And the abolition of indirect taxes that occurs repeatedly in the programmes of of traditional socialist parties. Now, on leaving the European Union, it will no longer be mandatory to maintain value-added tax Value-added tax is the only tax that is mandated by the European Union and it's the only source of revenue for the European Union, the share of value-added tax. This is indicative of the very conservative character of the European Union as an economic institution in that it deliberately eschews any kind of taxation which could change the relative balance of income between rich and poor. Now if we look at VAT, in 1979, shortly after going into the EU, VAT was only 8%. It's now 20%. The Tories have made great play on their their ability to reduce the base rate of income tax to 20%. It used to be 33%. It's been reduced to 20%. That's a 13% reduction in income tax. But at the same time, there's been a 12% increase in VAT to offset it, so that people are actually taxed more heavily now than before. 
because VAT is a more regressive tax than income tax. In the UK, you get a tax-free allowance on income tax. You, you pay no income tax on the first 11,500 that you earn. But on the other hand, if you go out and spend your 11,500 on goods in the shops, you'll be paying 20% VAT on that. So the net effect of the shift from income tax to VAT is to transfer the section of income which the poor got untaxed into something that gets taxed as VAT. If VAT were abolished and the revenue raised by progressive income tax, that's clearly beneficial to those on low incomes. And it's possible to have taxes that are biased the opposite way. Before the VAT, the UK had purchase tax, which unlike value added tax, was levied only on luxury goods. So it was a class-based tax designed to hit those on higher incomes. It was introduced during the war when the intention was to divert production from luxuries to war production so that the only civilian production going on was of absolute necessities. Under the post-war Labour government, it was used to divert output from the consumption of the well-off into building up the nationalised industries, funding council house building and the welfare state. The policy response in this area is to say we should be aiming to replace VAT with a luxury goods tax and in general to reduce the share of government revenue raised by indirect taxation. And certainly all basic items of working class consumption should be tax free. There are advantages to being able to selectively raise tax on categories of luxuries that are in in the main imported, though it's a little difficult to, to determine exactly what those would be, but you can... Imported luxuries, if they're heavily taxed, will tend to control the trade deficit. But the bias of... or the class bias of the tax system is bl absolutely blatant in Britain. Not only has income tax been reduced and VAT on necessities increased, but income of the capitalist class from dividends is taxed at a lower rate than wages are. So the base rate of tax on dividends is only 7.5%. The base rate of tax on wages is 20%. The top rate of tax on wages is 45%. And the top rate of tax on dividends is only 38%. So you couldn't get a clearer example of how the tax system is designed to benefit those who live off the labour of others rather than those who work for an income. The lower rate of tax that shareholders face is only the most blatant example of bias because there's a whole ba mass of hidden means by which both firms and individuals who are wealthy use tax havens, which are often in British territories, to avoid paying tax. This use of British territories to avoid paying tax doesn't just affect Britain, lots of other countries. Um, have rich people who set up their tax base in British colonies in that way. A book I can recommend is Oligarchy by Geoffrey Winters, where he shows how the tax system of all the Western oligarchies is designed to make the working class and the middle classes pay taxes whilst excusing the rich. Let's look at some of the, the concrete dodges that are, are being used at the moment in Britain. A major one is to desire, disguise someone's income as loans. A rich person sets up a company in the, in the Cayman Isles, for example. 
they then have their salary, royalties, etc., paid to this company, which just bills their employer for services rendered. So officially, the person is not an employee of whoever they're working for in Britain. Officially, they are just an agent for the company in the Cayman Islands, and they are pr supplying services to the British employer on the behalf of this company in the Cayman Islands. The money is then all paid to the Cayman Islands and is free from tax. The company in the Cayman Islands then loans them money for their personal expenditure or purchases cars for them for company use. And they make them a loan uh, on a long-term loan, which they're not going to have to pay back before they're dead. This is a favourite means by which wealthy media and sports personalities are avoiding uh, their taxes. Um, an interesting side effect of this is that it raises the reported trade deficit of the country. Suppose the BBC pays a presenter's company in the Cayman Islands. This service by the BBC presenter then appears to actually be an import into this country. It appears in the trade statistics as an import. And the loans made to the presenter from the company in the Cayman Islands then appears foreign borrowing on the British capital account. So the net effect is to raise the, tra the, the trade deficit uh, entirely artificially as an artifact of people avoiding tax. Another similar technique is to divert profit into other forms of surplus value. Corporation tax is only payable in profits. So you get the owners of a firm operating in Britain, recapitalizing it, replacing share capital with loan capital from a front company in the Bahamas. The company in Britain then shows no profits since the, all the operating surplus is devoted to paying interest on the loans they took, took out from their front company in the Cayman Islands. The corporation tax liability is therefore wiped out and again net foreign debt is increased and outflow of currency is increased. Another scheme like this is one run by companies which have clear branding. An international coffee company, for example, might claim that it was importing international prop intellectual property in the form of branding from a holding company in Panama. So most of its operating surplus is then diverted into royalties supposedly paid for the use of the brand name and goes to Panama where it's not taxed. Again, tax is avoided and a deficit appears on the trade account. In this case, it'll appear in the foreign trade account as imports of, royalty, of, of branding in, uh, and, and intellectual property. Well, what's the kinds of response you can make to this? Well, obviously, Dividend income should be taxed at a rate no lower than wages. That's all absolutely basic. But that doesn't get over the scandal of the Cayman Islands, the Channel Islands, the Isle of Man, the Bahamas, etc. Acting as tax havens. But all of these are British overseas territories. And in principle... They could all be made part of the UK and subject to UK tax and corporation law. If that were done, the territories would need corresponding compensation. They would need representation in the UK Parliament. They would need full rights to, for their citizens to use the NHS and the welfare state and pensions. Now, in the Cayman Islands, the and the Bahamas, the rights of ordinary people to welfare services are, are, are terrible, but 
that doesn't matter since these are tax havens that the British state essentially maintains for the British elite and the elite of other uh, Western countries to avoid paying taxes. Now that, that should be put an end to. For income tax purposes, all personal loans that are received by individuals or companies from companies or individuals outside the UK should be treated as income and liable to taxation. And instead of basing company taxation on corporation tax, you should recognise, as Marxist economics does, that profit, interest, rent and royalties are all just diverted forms of surplus value. Tax should be levied on the surplus value, on the operating surplus. And interest, rent and royalties would not be deductible for purposes of tax liability. There is no point in allowing the property owning classes to avoid tax by moving surplus value between different headings. OK, I've now covered the economic background, economic objectives, exchange rate policy and tax policy. I'll later get on to issues to do with property relations, production relations and democracy and defence.